episode is brought by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you! Hello everyone and welcome back to another installment in the series Paleo Myths. In the last episode, we looked at arguments as to why Megalodon may still be alive, and I think those arguments fraud my last brain cell. Next up, we'll look at a myth that isn't as immediately obvious. Eh, maybe. Let's return to everyone's favorite Hell Creek Formation. Yeah! To determine whether the Ceratopsian Taurosaurus is its own genus, or really just represents a more mature Triceratops. Well, of course I know him. He's me. Yes, we are going back to Maastrichtia, North America, to once again determine whether marginocephalians are ontogenetic stages of one another. It's weird that this happened twice, but you can think of it as practice for the ultimate ontogeny mystery. This debate heated up a decade ago, but has since seemingly simmered down, allowing us to go back to analyze the fallout of this myth. Which side came out on top? Let's dig this up. Taurosaurus, in my opinion, is a criminally underrated dinosaur that rarely shows up in paleo media. Most notably, it appeared in Walking with Dinosaurs, as well as several Jurassic games. Part of its obscurity may be the fact that it was described in 1891, only two years after the enigmatic Triceratops Horridus. While the earlier name reached stardom, Taurosaurus found itself stuck in a sea of obscurity. You're trash. That name, Taurosaurus, is actually quite unclear, depending on whether you're translating it from Latin or Greek. It can mean bull lizard or perforated lizard, respectively. Of course, alluding to being a large horned herbivore or those huge fenestrae or holes in the frill. Othniel Marsh didn't bother to clarify what he meant in his description, but probably the Greek. Both genres include two of their own recognized species. With Triceratops, there's the classic T. Horridus, along with its later emerging descendant, T. Prorsus. Meanwhile, we know of Taurosaurus lattice and T. utaensis. Both genera were titanic chasmosaurine ceratopsids from late Cretaceous North America. Adult, or supposed adult, Triceratops reached lengths of 8 to 9 meters and a mass between 5 and 9 metric tons. Taurosaurus specimens seem to rival even the larger trikes, though their postcranial material is severely lacking. Previously regarded as close relatives, back in the late 2000s, our old friend Jack Horner and his graduate student John Scanella began looking into the relationships between strikingly similar dinosaurs. Rather than having many distinct genre and species, they thought, what if dinosaurs drastically changed appearance as they aged through a process called ontogeny? That would leave us with far fewer dinosaur species than previously thought. Their smoking gun to prove their hypothesis was the study of spongy metaplastic bone, seeing how this type of bone can grow or reabsorb as an animal ages. Finding metaplastic bone, they argued, was indicative of immaturity. After slicing open the remains of several Hell Creek taxa, they noticed that even older looking Triceratops were spongy. Ah, but not Taurosaurus, Taurosaurus had a fully mature bone structure. But what if I were to take adult Triceratops and disguise it as Taurosaurus? Horner claimed that as a Triceratops really matured, their frills drastically elongated and developed these two giant parietal fenestrae to lighten the now bigger frill, meaning that what we thought of as Taurosaurus is truly an older trike. These supposedly more mature individuals have been dubbed Torvomorphs. After these claims, some news outlets went into full fake news mode to claim that Triceratops didn't exist. Scary news headlines bring in more views, so who cares about the truth, I guess? Liar! Don't worry, guys, if this paleo myth turns out to be true, the Triceratops generic name still sticks, since it came first, so Taurosaurus would become invalid. Even Horner himself made this point clear. But let's head over to the facts. Were Horner and Scanella right? Is Taurosaurus invalid? <laughs> mm. First time. 
The way to test this hypothesis will follow the same rules established in the Pachycephalosaurus video, and I've pulled these straight out of Nicholas Longrich and Daniel Fields' 2012 publication on this debate. To determine whether Toro really is a growth stage, we have three questions to check. Did the species live at the same time and place? Are all Torosaur specimens more mature than all Triceratops? And have we found transitional forms between the two? Each of the answers here are more complicated than one would expect, but hey, if it was easy, this wouldn't have been such a debate. Starting with that first question, are Torosaurus and Triceratops found in the same time and place? Um, kinda? A map of their distribution is presented in the aforementioned paper's figures, showing which formations each genus had been found. You have to admit, there is a massive overlap across Western North America during the late Maastrichtian, 68 to 66 million years ago, at the end of the Cretaceous. Both inhabited the Frenchman, Hell Creek, Lance, and Denver formations. Unfortunately for the myth, this overlap is not perfect. Triceratops reached more northern latitudes where no toros have been discovered in the Scollard Formation of Alberta. The latter dino, on the other hand, had a range extending more south, going as far as the Javelina Formation near the Mexican border. It's a little suspicious how their ranges don't totally overlap, though this may be due to incomplete sampling. It's still possible that they extended even further into each other's ranges with more southern certified Triceratops and more northern Torosaurus, but the fossil evidence just has yet to be found. Possible, yes. Likely, eh. So I'll leave this one as a kinda. Next up, if Torosaurus is the mature adult form, then all its specimens found must be mature adults. Then all Triceratops must be sub-adults or younger. If these two parameters are not met, then the whole idea falls apart. So, are there any fully matured trike-looking trikes? One way to identify maturity in vertebrates is to analyze the level of fusion in an animal's bones. Immature vertebrates have unfused bones that come together during maturity. We know this to be true with humans, and it applies to long extinct dinosaurs as well. Once fusion is achieved, growth rates are limited since there's a lack of space left for bone growth. In ceratopsids more specifically, the frill grows in width, in length, in height, attaining tremendous sizes with Torosaurus. Those menacing post-orbital horns lengthen and shift from pointing backwards, to upwards, to forwards. Bone surface texture goes from being more striated, to becoming bumpy and rugose. And also, despite being commonly depicted in popular media, their gnarly frill spikes actually smooth out, fusing into the rest of the frill as the ceratopsid ages. With such changes in mind, paleontologists can figure out what constitutes a mature or immature specimen. Well, okay, you can also cut into their leg bones and count the growth rings like trees too, but uh, post-creating material isn't as common as skulls for these guys. We'll go back to that one in the third Hell Creek ontogeny mystery. In their study, Longridge and Field uncovered many confirmed Triceratops specimens of both species to be adults rather than mere sub-adults. Okay, it doesn't look great on the Triceratops under things. How about with Torosaurus? Surely all so-called Toromorphs are fully matured adults, right? Ah, oh, s**t. Here we go again. Perhaps the biggest nail in the coffin for this myth, there are examples in the fossil record of immature individuals. Torosaurus lattice specimens YPM1831 and ANSP15192 both retain features associated with not fully mature individuals such as several skull bones not fully fused, along with portions of more striated bone texture indicative of growing bone rather than the final form rugos texture. YPM 1831 is considered by Longrich and Field study to be a sub-adult despite its enormous size, while ANSP 15192 is placed as a younger adult. It appears as if, maybe like human teenagers, Chasmosaurians were able to grow large sizes before fully maturing, 
and due to individual variation or sexual dimorphism, some sub-adults grew larger than some young adults. Humans are obviously a terrible analog for Taurosaurus, but just to paint a clear picture for audiences of what may be happening. Apart from the 2012 study, it looks like an actual juvenile Taurosaurus utaensis from the Javelina Formation had already been identified back in 2008 by Rebecca Hunt and Thomas Lehman based on some fragmentary material. That's about all I can access without hitting the paywall, so if anyone in the comments wants to add more to this, be my guest. Needless to say, if we have Triceratops specimens clearly more mature than some Taurosaurus specimens, then we can reasonably conclude that the latter is not a mature version of the former. Alright, alright, alright. But what if we find transitional forms between the two? Something in between that shows a clear transition from the solid frill of a Triceratops into the giant hold Toromorph. According to Horner and Scanella, we have that very creature. Meet Nidoceratops hatcheri, a very controversial species from the Lance Formation. It's known from just a single skull, USNM 2412. You've met him, said hi, gotten to know each other? Okay, now say your goodbyes because both sides, whether you're on Team Lump or Team Split, seem to agree that this skull is representative of T. Horridus. What makes it look so gnarly is a post-mortem distortion after burial. Great, there's some common ground in both camps. However, Horner and Scanella believe this skull to be a missing link. Although it's incomplete, the specimen contains a small hole in the parietal bone that makes up part of the frill. This hole, it is argued, is the beginning of those large Toro fenestrae. Ha! So there is a transitional form. Ladies and gentlemen, we got him. Hold up, not so fast because it seems like this hole is not due to ontogeny, but is a pathology, an injury, due to its irregular shape and thicker bone growth around it. Perhaps this individual was stabbed by the horn of arrival or something, so the bone started to heal. Also, it's worth noting that Taurosaurus's parietal fenestrae don't line up with the thinner parietal fossae, or depressions, of Triceratops, where you'd expect the fenestra to form. In the trike, their depression runs from the parietal and length of the squamosals. In Taurosaurus, their holes are enclosed entirely within the parietal. In the end, it seems like there are no transitions between them. Wah, wah, wah. Will you cut that out? Going back to those three questions, we have two no's and an eh, kinda. So, what happened with that metaplastic bone horner identified? Well, of the 29 Triceratops he studied, only two larger specimens were sampled. Even then, perhaps bone remodeling isn't consistent throughout growth, with different bones reshaping at different times. Maybe their frills continue to grow even throughout maturity. More research should be done on this spongy material to paint a clearer picture. And the last point I want to make before moving on, we have two species of both Triceratops and Taurosaurus. In the former at least, we know these two species are stratigraphically different, with T. Horridus showing up before T. Prorsus, perhaps one evolving into the other. How do Horner and Scanella account for that? Where do the two Toro species fit in this? Are they only adults of Horridus with their small nose horns? Where are the adults of Prorsus? Or maybe the Paleomyth only counts one trike species? Or, or, we have to mix and match each Toro species to each trike species. I, I don't know. Anyways, you already see where this is going. It looks like I don't get to use my Spider-Man 2 meme today. Let's jump to the verdict. From the 2000s into the 2010s, lots of great work was done studying the ontogeny of some iconic dinosaurs. Jack Horner had a win with Draco Rex and Stiggy Moloch being Pachycephalosaurus, and the Nano Tyrannus debate seemed to be going more in his favor over time. Triceratops growing into Taurosaurus, though, this is when the joke was taken too far. Horner's jumping the shark moment, almost as bad as his jumping the student moment. It's interesting questioning the differences between the two very similar genre, but claiming that the differences were due purely to ontogeny is a bit much. Not a horrible question to ask, 
but one that is certainly unsupported when put under scrutiny. I'm not saying I hate the idea, but due to how much evidence goes against it, I've got to rank this myth as... That idea is just the worst. Taurosaurus, you're a lovely genus. That bizarre frill is awesome, and you probably struck fear into the hearts of any hungry rexes. Congratulations, buddy. You're still perfectly valid. Okay, I know I'm just an internet armchair who doesn't have any say in the matter, though it seems like the paleontologists who do think that you're valid, so I'll agree with them. Nice work, brother. And remember for you guys at home to please leave a like, subscribe, and to check out my social media. See you next time.